Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this day where we get to come together and worship you and celebrate you and pray to you. Uh, help us to think deep thoughts about uh, you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so last week we started looking at the first half of this. Not paper, it's called the tag guys. Um, it is a paper about presuppositional argumentation about uh, the transcendental argument for God. Big, heady words. So if you weren't here last week, uh, I will try as much as possible to <laughs> fill in all the uh, vocabulary that uh, you're missing out on. Um, also, uh, this is something I mentioned last week. Uh, it's somewhat controversial and reborn back to certain. I don't think it should be. Uh, and frankly, like there's, uh, you know, we've got visitors from the East Coast here. There's a big difference even in how the East Coast approaches this versus the West Coast. If you look at reborn back to the circles. So. Uh, yeah, if this uh, if this is not the can't be comfortable, then you're aware of what any of this means. I don't know what but, <laughs> but then again, I believe this is all true, so I don't apologize. Um, so we were talking about, so the, the question here is, the transcendental argument for God, for the existence of God, says that God is true because of the impossibility of the contrary. If you take some truth that uh, everyone agrees on, or your opponent agrees on, like beauty, <coughs> Or even if they don't say that they agree in it, on it, they act as though they do. You know, speaking things, they might deny morality, but even to speak and to assert things is to say that you should believe this, which is in itself a moral thing. Um, so you take something that's agreed on either implicitly or explicitly, and you demonstrate that apart from Christian God, uh, this thing does not exist. And so you, you disprove the other side, and as a result, prove your own. Um, it would be it would be improper to build up a case for uh, God's existence on some lesser foundation of authority. He is the ultimate authority. Uh, his authority rests on himself, not on anything else. And so to to make a lot of the arguments that people make, you know, because of your own reason and your own way of approaching things, and this evidence that I have, etc. And those not that evidences aren't real, but they don't demonstrate God. But if, if your foundation you're building from isn't the authority of God himself, to demonstrate God's authority, you're actually undermining his authority. Now, people will often respond to this and say, any other religion would use this same argument. They could all say, well, because God exists, therefore God exists, and I don't have to, uh, I don't have to deal with the argument. That's not exactly what we're saying. started covering the first one last week. The first is that Christianity is extremely unique. It's not, we're not just claiming that, uh, well, because of this, you know, um, philosophical fast one, I'm able to fool on you. Uh, God really exists. But rather, because of what the Bible says about God, because of what he says about himself, it really is the case that um, you could not have this universe apart from apart from him and the way he has disclosed himself. And particularly, uh, we were looking at the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is not the only thing that's unique about Christianity, but it uh, certainly is a, a fundamental one, thinking about the nature of God. Okay, let me see. Was that a... Yeah, so one more, one more bit of background. We were talking last week about what's known as the problem of the many and the one, right? That there is both unity diversity in the world. Uh, you know, I am made of, of many atoms that are constantly changing uh, their position and their, uh, you know, the space they're taking up, etc. Uh, and yet, there is the one unified concept of conliness, you know, my name being Conley, uh, of conliness uh, that remains constant, even though everything that exists in this spacious world is constantly changing. So how is, how is it that there is an identity that is unchanging? Is that just something we make up in our minds? Is it something that has real existence outside of our minds? You know, does treeness or commonness exist uh, beyond just something we make up? And it, it really does, if it doesn't, um, a lot of things end up breaking down. And I mentioned that uh, last week that different people have had different answers to this. The early Greek philosophers wrestled with this, and the earliest ones said, well, everything is ultimately many. The fundamental property in the universe
numbers just change and uh, everything is just constantly changing. So if you step in a street, uh, the, the, you, no man steps in the same river twice because it's not the same river the next time. All the water has changed, right? And later Greek philosophers said that everything is actually like Plato and Aristotle. Every, everything is fundamentally one. And so from that, you know, you have the, the Greek notion of, of forms and substances that are, that are unifying this world that is, that is otherwise diverse. I know this is uh, abstract stuff, so I'll, I'll give more examples. This also, I mentioned, exists in Eastern religions. Hinduism, the fundamental ten Hinduism, tenet of Hinduism is that everything is ultimately one. You have this one life essence called Brahman that uh, unifies everything together and establishes a basis for Atman, Atman being a self. Uh, and so in Hinduism, everything is, is fundamentally one, and the goal is to embrace that fully and just become one with everything. Right? Whereas in Buddhism, it's the exact opposite. Buddhism is a Hindu heresy, right? Uh, Siddhartha Gautama was a, was a Hindu who broke uh, off from Buddhism, and his view was exactly the opposite. Everything is actually fundamentally many. Uh, nothing has any identity. In fact, that's why uh, Buddhists embrace anatman, no self, right? And so they would say that, uh, you know, the fundamental goal is to realize that you don't even exist. You know, this, this lectern doesn't exist. This pew doesn't exist because it's constantly changing and there is no unity. There's no identity that is consistent across moments. You just have what was at that moment and then what was at the next moment, etc. So this is a this is a real problem, even if people aren't thinking about it from day to day. This is a fundamental thing that philosophers have wrestled with, both you know, Greek philosophers, Eastern philosophers, all kinds of people. How do you account for the fact that there is there are abstract concepts that remain unified? There's laws of logic, there's truth that remains true no matter how many moments pass. And yet, everything in this world, otherwise, is constantly changing. How do you how do you account for that? And the uniqueness of Christianity with the Trinity is that we, and not just posit as though uh, we're the ones coming up with this idea, but the Bible declares God, who is not only fundamentally one, and not only fundamentally diverse, but His unity and His diversity are equally ultimate. That He is one God in three persons. So he himself provides the foundation for a world that has diversity, but also unity. So we were on page five uh, and beginning with this, this quote at the top of the page. That's where we stopped. And please, if you're confused about anything, just raise your hand and I'll ask questions. All right, so God is strictly eternal exhaustively personal. Uh, the first point indicates that the Trinity is not in any measure dependent on an opposing, ever incomplete, temporal sphere that would compromise the finality of his knowledge and being. The second point indicates that the triune God is not married to any sort of unconscious being that would resist and fail to fully express his own eternal self-awareness and self-direction. Okay, so we're going to we're going to go through that in this next paragraph here. To rephrase, A, is the strictly true. If the principle that establishes the harmony between the unity and diversity is finite, there can be no knowledge. So, in other words, we're asking, what is it that unites diversities and unities? You know, is it our own mind? Is it, is it just me and then us, you know, collectively agreeing that, you know, there's some pewness to this set of atoms over here? Um, if that's the case, then it doesn't it doesn't really exist in the world. It only exists in our minds, and we are finite, and we will cease. And then if we cease, the puniness of this object ceases, right? So something that unites the two, that unites unity and diversity, that fundamental principle needs to be uh, eternal. And our God is strictly eternal. Because such harmony is found in relating a member of the many to all members of the many, in order to know anything at all, one must know everything. Okay, so in addition to that, in order for something to be, um, in order for um, uh, this harmony to be established, in order for 
for something to be uh, truly, truly known, it has to be uh, connected to all other truths. So, for example, uh, you know, I might say that I know that uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, but there is a way that God knows 2 plus 2 is 4 that's different than the way I know 2 plus 2 is 4, right? A good mathematician knows, well, that also implies that 2 times 2 is 4, and that also establishes that uh, 2 plus 2 times 2 is 8, and you get all kinds of, you're able to build all the mathematics out of that, and just, you know, we're not uh, so intelligent that we know all the implications of that one truth and how it relates to every other truth.
So point four, knowledge of the universe is not possible. Obviously, we can know things, and if we can't, we shouldn't be even, uh, if you have a dialogue partner who claims that you can't know something, uh, they're claiming that they know that they can't know something, so uh, you've got a, they've got a problem there. So knowledge of the universe is not possible, it isn't possible. Therefore, the ontology of the universe, the being of the universe, must be something such that uh, unity and plurality are co-ultimate. Therefore, Christian theism is the case, since only Christian theism posits an ontology in which unity and plurality are co-ultimate. You know, what other religion has the God who is both fundamentally uh, one and one, right? Who is one God in three persons, who is uh, unified in person at the same time. That ontology stands, of course, on the basis of the trinity. of the solution. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear all this, because it's so hard to understand, their immediate response will be that, you know, it doesn't, this is, I, I went from day to day, like for, for 20, 30, 40 years until I heard this problem, and I never had to answer it. You know, I never, I never even thought of this problem. So, uh, the, why can't we just say that, you know, knowledge is possible, and we just don't know on what basis it's possible. So it may not be immediately obvious that one would need to bring a solution to the problem of the one within. For example, could not one say that knowledge is possible on some currently unknown basis? The argument is not that non-Christian worldview, that the non-Christian worldview cannot offer a full explanation for the intelligible ability of the universe. Even a Christian cannot offer a full explanation. In other words, we're not saying that, oh look, we have the Trinity, therefore we can explain all of how knowledge is possible. No, we, uh, yeah, what God does to make knowledge possible, we don't, we don't understand it all. We're just saying that we can provide a basis for it. Uh, the argument is, uh, sorry, even the non-Christian, excuse me, <laughs> both appeal to mystery. In other words, things that are just unknown. However, the Christian appeals to a mystery which lies on God, one who is capable of providing an answer. And the non-Christian appeals to an uncertain reality which will not necessarily provide any answer. Furthermore, it is not as though the non-Christian's worldview merely might not provide an answer. It cannot provide an answer. Any answer that appears or that we might discover in the future would necessarily contradict the present unbelieving worldview. We might illuminate this issue with the illustration of a machine that makes us believe. The machine possesses various pigments that are then mixed in the cans. No one knows what the machine does to mix the paint, only that it does indeed mix it. Let us say that purple paint, at least on occasion, comes from the machine. Okay, so sometimes purple paint comes out of this machine. Uh, the unbeliever's worldview is akin to one who asserts that only red and yellow pigments exist within the machine. He does not know how purple is produced. But one day he hopes to understand the machine well enough to discover the mystery of how it produces purple from red and yellow, despite the fact that no such mixture is possible. The Christian's worldview is akin to one who asserts that blue pigment is also present in the machine. He does not know how purple is produced, but he has a basis on which it can be produced. Okay, so there's there's a difference between the two. The, neither of us are claiming to know what's going on in the machine, just that we have all the ingredients necessary for, for purple paint to come out, right? And so I'm not claiming I know how knowledge is possible exactly. What I'm claiming is that uh, I have a God who can make it possible where what uh, the unbeliever prescribes are not a triune God, you know, a God who is either ultimately one or ultimately many, uh, does, not have, does not have a basis on which knowledge is possible at all. It's just simply impossible. It's not just that we can't explain it. is ultimately one or ultimately many cannot provide a basis for rational thought. A world that is ultimately both also cannot if it provides the harmony uh, between the two. We get a synthesis that is positioned in a location that is either finite or non-personal. So, for example, it exists just in our minds or it, um, or it, it does exist in the universe but from an impersonal God who can't communicate it. Right? So our God is exalted in person. He's capable of communicating that knowledge to us. Uh, remember from what we talked about with knowledge, is, our knowledge is revelational. God reveals things to us, whether it be through creation or through his word, etc. 
Uh, thus, a solution is necessary, and only the triune God can provide the solution. All right, so at this point, you might say, all right, well, what about if somebody else takes a, a very similar approach? Uh, even barring the requirement of multi-personality, it is clear that very few religions meet the conditions to solve the problem of the moon and the war. Heretical variants of Christianity may be discarded by the rebellion against God's revelation. The only serious contender in this regard is Islam. So, in other words, okay, well, if you, if you claim, well, I know how knowledge is possible, it's based on the triune God, or it's based on the God of Scripture, but can you deny the core tenets of what he says in his word? Well, then obviously you can say that those worldviews are false. Right? Now, uh, yeah, who can, what, uh, what religion has a God who is both personal and, and born? You know, I mentioned Islam as being a serious contender here. However, adding the requirement of not only a personal God, but a multi-personal God changes such a discovery from improbable to impossible. First, it should be clear that no such religion, other than Christianity, has been posited until this time. Uh, some have suggested that the Trinity is mere in pagan religions. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that, that sentence needs to be the biggest deal. Say something about um, positing the Trinity. The Trinity. Uh, some have suggested the Trinity is mere in pagan religions. These religions have repeatedly been, repeatedly been shown to be tritheistic at best. Have you ever heard someone claim that? It's, oh yeah, Christianity, a near trinity, that comes from, you know, some uh, Greek myth where there's this three-headed person or <laughs> all kinds of things like that. Uh, usually this is just some tritheism that they're claiming uh, is where Christians got the trinity from, but not the case. Further, there are only two options for a god that would mimic the ontology of the biblical creator. He would either be based on the perversion of biblical revelation, okay, so basically you have a, you have the triune God of scripture, but then you're modifying his attributes to be something other than what Christian theism really is. Uh, or, in which case, you know, we can already show that he's false, because like I said, if you, if you deny his revelation, then um, it's not the same God. Or he would previously, be previously deistic, having not given revelation of himself until the present time. This would make the Christian God an idol that would have surpassed the true God in even revealing that which is unknowable apart from revelation. So let's say, you know, there's some new religion that pops up that has, uh, also has a trinity, right? Or a or something. Um, this, uh, if, if that, that religion were to just pop up, begin revealing these things, uh, how, how is it, if, or rather, um, isn't that embarrassing, though, that uh, there was this, you know, false religion of Christianity that was revealing these things this whole time, and then, and then this religion comes around and reveals, ah, oh, God is all knowing but uh, one in him, right, he is, uh, he is the Trinity. So if you, if you posit the idea that there could be this other uh, religion that shows up and has the qualities of Christianity, it's very clear that it's just mimicking Christianity. It's not actually a, um, it's not actually coming from a real God. It's coming from one who is imitating the true God. Okay, looking at Old Testament revelation. Our argument thus far may suggest that those saints living prior to the New Testament to New Testament revelation did not have sufficient sufficient justification for their knowledge. Right. So if you don't have uh, the revelation of the Trinity in the Old Testament. How can they justify that uh, the knowledge is possible without saying we need the Trinity in order to justify the possibility of knowledge? Uh, so this is not the case. While the Trinity is most certainly known through special revelation, God's unity and diversity may be seen even in the Old Testament. While the saints may not have been aware of this triune, they would not have been forced into a position that declares God to be a moment of incapable of providing the basis for reality that is both ultimately one in so, even though the Old Testament saints, uh, the Israelites, were not aware of the fullness of revelation that we have now of God's triune, that doesn't mean that they were Unitarians, you know, that they denied the triune, right? It doesn't mean that they, uh, yeah, they believed God was some kind of monism who was divine. Yeah. Sort of person. 
Additionally, while God has always provided people with certain knowledge of himself, there is no reason to think that he must, from the beginning, provide mankind with every apologetic utility that would be necessary until the second coming. Instead, it is right to understand that the completion of our defense has come with the completion of our canon. So, yeah, there's a reason that we have a fuller revelation of what's needed, or of, uh, of God, and are able to make these arguments is because uh, this is the final stage we're at. Yeah. Um, yes, Hebrews 1 speaks. No, this is the, uh, um, gosh, part of the point on the, on the phrase from Hebrews 1. <laughs> these last days, right, is the, it's the last days. Uh, by way of clarification, the purpose of this line of reasoning is not to suggest that ontology, so God's triunity, is the only unique aspect of Christianity. Or that the problem of the one and the many, at least as presented, is the sole problem that is uniquely solved by Christianity. So yeah, I'm not saying that this is the only unique thing that Christianity is offering, or this is the only way that the argument can be made. Uh, for example, John Frame speaks of ethics. Person here includes interpersonal attributes such as love. So uh, the God presupposed by ethics, epistemology, and logic must be multi-person. Have you ever thought about that? Um, so, you know, if ethics is real, if morality is real, and that's something that's, you know, been absolutely true and uh, has always existed, uh, it must come from one who is not only personal. Because if you don't have a multi person, you have a God who is just one and, and not also three. There's no, there's no, um, our, our God, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit have loved each other from all eternity. There is, there's a notion of love, there's a notion of, of rightness, of goodness. All these things exist because of their relationship between them, themselves. And if you uh, ruin that relationship, then in what sense can God even be personal? If there's if there's no potential for relationship, right? If there's no relationship. Um, so anyway, uh, ethics, epistemology, meaning uh, knowing things, logic, all those things uh, require actually it's not just uh yeah it's not just this one philosophical problem i've mentioned uh, one may sp suppose that ethics is not a necessary category to acknowledge the universe but it is not so easily disposed of when one reasons he argues for a position as true uh, when arguing a position as true he implies that it ought to be believed Thus, we see once again that Christianity is wildly unique in its providing for it beyond preconditions of intelligibility. Okay, so, yeah, if someone, if someone, I mentioned this earlier, but if someone is stating things as true, then they are stating that there is a right and there is a wrong, there is a good and there is an evil, even if they claim that good and evil don't exist. They're just claiming that you should believe this, and if you ought to believe this, and that, that implies some kind of ethics. So instead of the problem of the one and the many being the be-all, end-all of the transcendental argument for the existence of God, it is just one example of Christianity's uniqueness. By this example, we may more easily see the instances of the non-Christian worldview are cleanly separated from the Christian worldview. Tag does not merely address one subclass of the non-Christian worldviews in the entire body. Okay, so uh, the Trinity really is unique. Um, the question we have well, if you show that one religion is false, how are you showing that all the religions are false, especially if you haven't even heard of all the religions? Um, and this is, this is the, that was the first half of the answer. Now the next half of the answer is uh, probably the more powerful and better half. Um, Manuel, could you hand me a uh, tissue where I can grab it if you're trying to keep the, get the study room. So yeah, uh, if you've ever seen the transcendental argument for the existence of God, it shows that God is true by the impossibility of the contrary. When it rejects, and when it demonstrates that the person you're arguing with is that their religion is not true, you know, be it Hinduism or Buddhism, atheism, whatever it may be, how is that showing that all unbelieving religions are not true? 
there is there is more of an answer. And here we are talking about autonomy. Um, now we now progress to the second half of the Paul sermon's response. Second, the unbelievers' romantic hope that somehow, some way, autonomous man might be able to make sense of the universe apart from God represents a reliance on the irrationalist notion of open-ended chance that Van Til has already proven self-destructive. Okay, so without constructing a polemic against the notion of chance, uh, because, you know, from the world's perspective, uh, chance is not a real thing. Um, uh, Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast in the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So, there's, there's no such thing as chance. God is sovereign. Uh, we may see that this response contains a repudiation of the idea that autonomous man could make any sense of the universe apart from God. In other words, without God, man cannot begin to even discuss intelligibility. This provides an even more fundamental aspect of our response to the charge, the transcendental argument of the existence of God. does not refute So I think I think uh, a lot of that could be explained, and I'm going to do that in the next paragraph. So I'm going to just move on. Uh, the purpose of the previous response, i.e., showing that the relation of the Trinity and solving the problem of the one and the many, is limited in purpose. Uh, the objection that not every possible instance of the non-Christian worldview is handled by Peg most frequently comes from a misunderstanding of what the Christian worldview is. That is. There's a lack of perception about just how unique the Christian God is and how every other God is entirely unlike him. We have therefore shown how the Trinity is central to the argument, God's triunity and sovereignty being the source of Christianity's uniqueness among the world religions. However, that is all the response can offer. On its own, it cannot go farther and demonstrate that. Uh, the non-Christian can 
cannot suppose that such a God exists, because he has no foundation from which to make such a supposition. One whose worldview is unworkable cannot argue for even the possibility of a worldview that is workable. It is akin to spinning gold from straw. To make such an argument, one would have to have some foundation which gives a basis for suggesting probabilities and determining impossibilities. The only worldview that offers this is a Christian worldview which will not allow for another worldview to be seriously positive. One cannot admit that their, one cannot admit that their autonomy is a failure and at the same time autonomously resist submission to the triumph of God. All right. So let me explain that because I, I, I get that all that's really hard to follow. But I think, I think uh, this can be explained in a fairly simple way. All right. The, the question that we start off with is how do you know that there isn't some religion out there that can provide an explanation for how everything exists. Sure, you know, Hinduism ends up not being able to do it. Buddhism ends up not being able to do it. False versions of Christianity show themselves false by contradicting their own plain scriptures. Um, how can we how can we know that all the other religions are true, even the ones we haven't even the ones we haven't addressed? And especially if we're talking about making an argument with an unbeliever and you've shown his worldview to be false. How can you keep him from just saying, well, maybe there is one out there, but it's not Christianity, right? And it's probably not Christianity, something like that. Okay, so the, the idea of supposing a another worldview out there that can answer all these questions um, is basically autonomous. Autonomous being this word I use here, you know, us imagining that the foundation of knowledge is our own rationality and not God revealing things to ourselves, right? Uh, this is, I mentioned this last week, uh, found in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what does good and evil mean? Uh, it does not mean that Adam, uh, obviously he already experienced good, okay? So it's not talking about experiencing good and evil. He had already experienced good. It's not about um, knowing what evil is, God told him it was wrong to eat of the tree. He already knew that that was evil. It was instead uh, autonomy. <coughs> uh, you look at the phrase good and evil in scripture and you see that it's what it's what the Bible uses to describe judges, ones who know what right and wrong is and are determining that as an authority, right? So Solomon is said to know good and evil. He's a judge who you know makes determinations for the evil, right? So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is basically saying, rather than letting God be the judge, I'm going to take matters into my own hand to decide what right and wrong is and good and evil is. This is the original sin. This is the root of all sin, is that autonomy, where I'm not being directed by God, but I'm directing myself. And the one who imagines that their own knowledge is self-directed rather than uh, revealed, right, is able to hypothesize all these different you know, religions that might exist, that might be able to account for these things. So what's the problem with that? Okay, first of all, the Christian uh, has forfeited any notion of autonomy. The Christian acknowledges that uh, God is the one who is the foundation of truth. He is the one who reveals things to man, and he has revealed us in his word. So from a Christian perspective, could there be another religion out there that, that satisfies these various problems that we've pointed out, these things that Christian can't do it because the Bible already tells us that there is no other God, that only God is the true God. You know, countless verses in Isaiah saying that there is no God like me. Um, now, what about, okay, so that, that's the Christian in the discussion. So, from the Christian perspective, obviously, that other worldview is impossible. Now, from the other person's perspective, the one who is arguing against his worldview has just been shown to be false, right? So now he's hypothesizing, well, maybe there's another worldview out there. Well, on what basis is he making that hypothesis? He's just been shown that he doesn't have a foundation for uh, explaining how knowledge is even possible. How do you make a hypothesis unless you have a very good, I suddenly got very loud. <laughs> uh, how do you make a hypothesis and know that the, that hypothesis is meaningful if you don't have a, a foundation from which to make it, right? If your worldview has just been shown to be false. It's only if you think that you truly are autonomous and there's some common ground that everyone's standing on that uh, you know, gives you free access to these sorts of um, moves.
use these sorts of hypotheses. Well, when the reality is, if your worldview is considered to be false, anything that you suppose should be just rejected as you know being unfounded. And the only way you can make a hypothesis, you know, if your ship, if your ship on which knowledge stands is sinking because it's been shown to be false, because you know, depending on whatever worldview it is, and the Christian has demonstrated to be false, is is failing. The only ground you have to make a hypothesis from is this other ship right here, right? The Christian ship. And you can't make that hypothesis from the Christian worldview. So this really all comes down to just the fact that the, the reason why people have trouble thinking about this is because sin is so serious and has so deeply affected the way we think that we think of ourselves as autonomous and even our knowledge of autonomous and the ability to hypothesize these these other religions that might be able to solve this problem that might also be true uh, is coming from a place of, well, it's coming from a place of that autonomy. But if you recognize that what's just been disproven is your autonomy, is your ability to make those kinds of hypotheses, and rather you must submit to the uh, worship of Christ, to, to God, and his gospel, then um, yeah, you're just not able to make those claims. Yeah, 
this, this section here about the impossibility of the hypothesis, that's really the key one, so if you didn't understand that one, please, please ask questions. Any questions? Yes? Can you do that one more time? You want me to just go over it and review it? Sure. Okay, so, all right, let's say uh, you're talking with an unbeliever and you've shown that their worldview is false, okay? But that's kind of the assumption. We're already, you know, doing that is its own task. But we're pretending for the sake of this discussion that you've already demonstrated their worldview is false. Something they believe may be, you know, inconsistent or wrong, right? Um, once you've done that, how can they, how can you keep them from just saying, well, can't there be some other, some other religion that's not Christianity that, that answers all these problems? From a Christian perspective, that's impossible because uh, Christianity, the Bible, declares that God is exclusively God. There is not another God out there. There's not another religion out there that is true. Okay? And then from their perspective, they can't, they don't have the grounds to, which, to argue for that because you just showed the world to be false. Right? If you showed, you know, your Hinduism is false or your Buddhism is false or your atheism is false, if you show them that, that their worldview is false and that their understanding of, of where knowledge comes from is false, how do they make a knowledge claim that there could be something out there, right? How do you argue that there could be another religion out there if your understanding of how to even make knowledge claims or, or basis on which knowledge is true is, has been proven faulty? You know, back to that sinking ship analogy. It's, you know, the ship is underwater. You can't really do anything with it. You you only have to. Yeah, you can, the only ship around that you can climb to is the the Christian ship. And yeah, I guess part of the ship analogy you hear that one often is because a lot of people imagine because you know they think of themselves as autonomous. There's just lots of options out there, even if we haven't discovered them. But that's not really how it works because we're not uh, these autonomous beings who are able to hypothesize such things. We're just, you know, we're, we're standing on presuppositions. And that's, that's it. I don't know. Did that answer for you? Mm, I may have to pick your brain more. Yeah. I, I mean, I had, to, I had to work over this, I don't know, probably 20 times with, with a friend who was trying to teach me this stuff. But once you get it, then you, man, the level of uh, assurance gives you, whereas before, you know, yeah, I, I feel like for me, at least, you know, I was a Christian who trusted God. And when people would argue with me about Christianity, and I would demonstrate their worldview to be false, and then they act, then they say, well, maybe there's some other religion out there. I would know in my heart of hearts there isn't, because I knew that God is true. But I, I, I feel like it's important to be able to explain that in a way that they should have to acknowledge it too. And I know that I know that they are also aware of God because Romans one says that God has demonstrated His power and glory, etc. But yeah, if it's not, if that's not something that can be articulated, it seems there's something wrong. And it is, it is something that actually can be articulated. Why they can't just hypothesize these things, they don't. Discussions, but a 
lot of this utility is just in having a deepening understanding of the majesty of your own God. So, what do you do for someone like that? I think I think this argument can be uh, re-explained in simpler terms. You know, if they, if, if you're at that point, they say it's it's uh, you know the universe started.